honor to discuss the role of ultrasounds in obstetrical emergency and we are currently teaching we come across in our daily practice with patients of obstetrical and they come with various presenting complaints. The commonest they are the pelvic pain and the vaginal bleedings. These are the commonest complaints which we have to see for and we have to investigate what etiological factors there at ultrasound examinations. A few other presenting complaints, they include the loss of fetal movements, excessive discharge per vaginum, and sometimes patient comes with prolapse of something coming through the vaginal canal. So the commonest complaint is the pain in the lower abdomen or pain in the pelvis, and ultrasound helps to diagnose early intrauterine pregnancy, and sometimes this is not visible, we have to find for that topic pregnancy and sometimes both with the trans abdominal and endovaginal group we are unable to see the pregnancy even for the pregnancy that's positive and that we label as the pregnancy of the unknown patients. And in the early intrauterine pregnancy normally uh, pain may be there and you can see here this is the endovaginal ultrasound and we can see the gestational sac and with uh, yolk sac and the embryo visible. Likewise, sometimes there is a pain, severe abdominal pain, and there is pregnancy inside the uterus and at the adnexal region there is a huge cyst in the pelvis that may be a hemorrhagic cyst. Sometimes that gets ruptured also and that is the cause of the pain in the low abdomen. So whenever there is pregnancy and patient comes with the pain, we have to see whether the pregnancy is normal, there is an abnormal finding in the adnexal regions or not. And most of the time there is free fluid in the cutty sac as well as there in the abdominal space and the first thing which comes in mind is the ectopic pregnancy which we can see both with transabdominal as you can see here and the endovaginal root here is the uterus and you can see the free fluid in the uh, you can see the uh, fluid there in the petrolinal space as well and this is the fluid in the cardiac sac and here you can see a thick wall cystic area in one of the adnexal regions and also with the endovaginal scan we can confirm the presence of that topic pregnancy but never ever forget to see for the ruptured corpus you can see sometimes there is pain in the pelvis we are unable to see intrauterine pregnancies and also in the adnexal region there is no pregnancy that may be a case of the ruptured corpus uterus cyst. Here is the case where you can see the normal intrauterine pregnancy and there is free fluid in the cardiac sac and there is the rupture of the cyst in the adnexal region. So whenever the patient comes with the pain in the pelvis and there is free fluid, first think of that topic pregnancy but never ever forget the corpus uterus cyst which may rupture and produce pain in the early pregnancy. The second commonest uh, presentation is the bleeding of vaginum that may or may not be associated with the pain and that are variety of the etiological factors. They may be placental causes, fetal or the uterine causes. In the placental causes, there is the perigestational hematoma that is the bleeding from the chorionic frondosum which is the future site of the placenta and at ultrasound we can see a rim of fluid around the gestation sac and you can see here with the gestation sac and there is rim of fluid this is labeled as the perigestational hemorrhage and may be a cause of bleeding pavaginus. The second cause is the subcorean hematoma which is the separation of the placenta from the myometrium and you can see a crescent shape and a quick area as you can see here this is the subcorean hematoma and we have to measure the amount of the subcorean hematoma if it is less than 60 ml that case is a good prognosis, but if it is massive subcoronic hematoma, that may have the poor prognosis. We have to follow up the case that the pregnancy goes normal or if there is some problem inside. As you can see here, this is a small subcoronic hematoma, and this is the large one we can see alongside the pregnancy. The abruptio placenta is the term used for the placental separation after 20 weeks of gestation, and uh, to begin, it may be uh, most of the time may be missed because in the early case whenever there is bleeding that is echogenic and that is also echo to the placenta and difficult to differentiate at the examination but as time advances 
there is hypoechoia area which we can see behind the placenta and that is a case of the abrasive placenta a cause of bleeding for the genome. The placenta previa is an other cause of the bleeding that is due to the thinning of the lower part of the uterus as the pregnancy advances and that may produce the bleeding for the genomes. The strophoglossic changes within the placenta that is labeled as the mole or molar pregnancy that may be the complete mole or partial mole if all of the uterus is full of hypogenic mass with multiple small vesicles inside that is a complete mole and whenever we see the embryo or the fetus all the gestations have been associated with the trophoblastic changes of the placenta that is the partial mode. <laughs> then failed pregnancy that is the preg pregnancy which is either failed or is failing that will also produce the breeding parvigenum and that is labeled as the abortions which may be threatened, inevitable, incomplete or the missed abortion if the patient comes with the pain and bleeding and you see at other sounds that there is a normal yolk sac, normal embryo and the visible cortic activity that we clinically label as the threatened abortions. And then the sac lie in the lower uterine segment or the anatomic area superior to the sac that or sac lie within the cervix it means that pregnancy has to get aborted that is labeled as the inevitable abortion or abortion in progress. And you can see here there is the incompetency of the internal loss of the cervix and the pregnancy. So this is the case of the abortion in progress or inevitable abortions. And sometimes there is hysteria amenorrhea and bleeding and we see the choreo residual tissue as an apogenic substance within the body of the uterus and that is a retained products of conceptions and that is a case of incomplete abortion as you can see here apogenic substance within the body of the uterus that may have flow or absent flow on the doctor examinations. The missed abortion is the term when the baby, when the fetus dies inside but is retained that is labeled as a missed abortion we will see an embryo with no party activity and that is the missed abortion in other case where the baby is dead inside and that is a case of missed abortion that will also be a cause of bleeding polygenics. Then ectopic pregnancy, most of the speakers have already discussed which is the implantation of fertilized ovum outside the uterine cavity and we will see the desigualization of the endometrium and thick wall cystic area in the adnexal regions and the cardiac activity of the embryo may or may not be visible at the examinations and the uh, common screen which is there is the free fluid in the caldi sac or free fluid in the lower abdominals. Then interstitial ectopic pregnancy is the pregnancy within the interstitial part of the clopping tube. We have to measure the distance between the sac and the serosa. If it is less than 5 mm, that is thinning of the myometrium, definitely it is case of the interstitial ectopic. As you can see here in this, this is a glass abdominal ultrasound examination. I have seen two days back and this is the end of the vaginal, the distance is less than 5 mm, so it was a case of the interstitial ectopic pregnancy. Then time pregnancy may get implanted in the lower part of the uterus, on trans abdominal cystic cystic area, and on endovaginal scan you see the yolk sac inside that cystic area, so it is cervical ectopic pregnancy. Abdominal ectopic is labeled when there is the implantation of the particular ovum outside the uterus and fallopian tube or the ovary, in the peritoneal cavity, the uterus will be empty and the fetus will be visible outside. And there is heterotopic gestation, which is the simultaneous uh, implantation of the ovum, one within the cavity and second outside in the tuber area. That, that is called the, uh, the heterotopic pregnancy. Another fetal cause of the bleeding parvaginum is when there is multiple pregnancy and one fetus is vanishing off as you can see the twin pregnancy one which is normal where the other is that one so that will produce that bleeding parvaginum as you can see here this is the live fetus having the cardiac activity and this is the dead fetus so vanishing one in multiple pregnancy will also be responsible for the bleeding parvaginum then some uterine causes which includes the uterine malformation as this is the bicarbonate uterus pregnancy here in the left column of uterus the right column is empty and that will produce the bleeding. Another case where we will see a pregnancy in one horn of the uterus, the other horn which is empty, that will produce the bleeding problems. 
then pregnancy with intraditrine contraceptive device or transmia property inside the uterus and then the live embryo alongside it and that will also produce the bleeding and sometimes the fibroid in association with the pregnancy will be a positive agent of the bleeding for vaginal in the early pregnancies. Trauma to the mother uh, may be uh, cause of the shock for the mother as well as cause of the bleeding because it may produce the direct trauma to the fetus, there may be the abrasive placenta or there may be the ruptured membrane which will cause the bleeding for vagina and at ultrasound examination you will see the loss of fluid and this is epidemic blood within the cervix. So trauma is also a cause of the bleeding for vagina in the pregnancies. Then third thing which come across the third presentation is the loss of fetal movements. Whenever there is loss of fetal movements, we have to see the cardiac activity. First of all, if the cardiac activity is absent, as you can see here in this picture, it means this is a definite case of the intrauterine fetal demise. There are some other parameters by which we can confirm the fetal demise. They include the robot sign, which is a gas within the blood vessels of the fetus. They may be the soft. As you can see here, this is the gas within the heart of the fetus. The limb vessel, this is because of the degeneration of the blood, and this uh, sign comes within 12 hours after the death. Then there is the soft tissue edema, which comes within 12 to 24 hours after the intrauterine fetal demise. As you can see here, this is the edema around the scalp as well as the edema around the chest wall. Then is the spreading sign, which comes seven days after the intrauterine fetal demise, and that of the fetal skull bones as you can see here the overlapping of the fetal skull bones so the definite uh, point for the fetal death uh, evaluation is the absent cardiac activity but we can also see the robot signs of tissue edema and the spotting sign as well and if the fetal cardiac activity is present but there is loss of movements then we have to go for the uterine artery as Dr. Amjad has well elaborated as you can see less turning flow, so this is the mild placental insufficiency and here the absent turning flow, this is the moderate placental insufficiency and here the reversal of the diastolic flow means that there is not placental insufficiency, immediate C-section has to be done for that patients. Then fourth presenting feature is the retention of the urine which is most of the time associated with the retroflex because of the pull of the cervix on the bladder neck that will produce the bladder outlet obstructions. And this is a transient fire finding which goes off up till 14 to 16 weeks of the pregnancy and sometimes a huge fibroid within the cervix may produce pull on the neck of the bladder and that will produce the urinary retention. So urinary retention whenever is there, we have to see the position of the uterus and the cervix we have to see for any mass or growth. Then the fifth feature which is there is the excessive vaginal discharge which is most of the time due to the rupture of the membranes and that we can see at ultrasounds by the history as well as finding of the previous hypermia there is no fluid around the normal live fetus and that is because of the ruptured membrane producing the excessive vaginal discharge. Then, last one complaint is the prolapse of something parajamins that prolapse may be the prolapse of the membranes or that may be the prolapse of the cords. Whenever the, the membrane is prolapse, we will see the bulging of the cervical canal and shortening of the cervical canal and that is a typical feature of the prolapse of the membranes through cervical canal and you can see here of the cervical canal, the shortening of the length and the rotation of the internal os that is producing the bulging of the membrane and sometimes there is the prolapse of the cord. If the membranes are intact, it is labeled as the cord presentation and when the membranes get ruptured, that is labeled as the cord prolapse and cord prolapse produce the compression and later on fetal asphyxia and we can see at Especially on the doctor it has examination, you can see the colorful things prolapsed through the vaginal canal. So 
In this way, various obstetrical emergencies can well be evaluated at ultrasound examination and managed accordingly. And with that, thank you very much.